No scripture lesson comes from Philippians 4, 1 through 9. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and miss, who are my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord. Loved ones, I urge Euodia and I urge Syntyche to come to an agreement in the Lord. Yes, and I am also asking you, loyal friends, to help these women who have struggled together with me in the ministry of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the scroll of life. Be glad in the Lord always. Again, I say, be glad. Let your gentleness show in your treatment of all people. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything. Rather, bring up all of your requests to God in your prayers and petitions, along with giving thanks. Then the peace of God that exceeds all understanding will keep your hearts and minds safe in Christ Jesus. From now on, brothers and sisters, if anything is excellent and if anything is admirable, focus your thoughts on these things. All that is true, all that is holy, all that is just, all that is pure, all that is lovely, and all that is worthy of praise. Practice these things. Whatever you learn, receive, heard, or saw in us. The God of peace will be with you. Let's pray. Dear God, may my words be your words, and those words that are not of you fall upon deaf ears. Amen. There is a famous pastor, and indirectly, he's one of my preaching teachers. He was the um, teacher of my mentor for preaching. Um, but he once said, preach from your weaknesses, for you will always have enough material. Today is one of those days where I heed his advice. Because this week was a rough week. This is my dear Gamecock. Who decided not to show up to the game on Thursday night against A&M. For those of you who do not, not know, I'm a big football fan. And if you didn't know before today, you will definitely know by the time December rolls around because I am a huge football fan. And sadly, I went to the game on Thursday. And sadly, they did not win. And when I say they did not win, it was 52 to 28. They really did not win. Um, and so it's just been kind of a hard week and I understand that people have had harder weeks than myself but um, it's been a hard week for a couple other reasons but when I picked this series I, it was strictly selfish I'm going up for commissioning um, again in the spring and I have a lot of paperwork due and when you do your commissioning paperwork they have certain passages that you have to use for preaching and so I figured if I used some of those passages, eventually I would get one of them right. Um, and so I didn't know a month ago how this passage would affect me personally this week. You see, this past week brought some conflict in my personal life. Now, we don't know the type of conflict between Euodia and Sintichi. Yes, I had to spell out the phonetic spelling of that. We know that there was some sort of disagreement between the two of them that Paul had heard about. But you can hear their sight for them in his writing. And so we know that it probably wasn't something worth relinqu relinquishing them from power. Maybe it was a disagreement about the law. Maybe about one of them doing more work than the other. Maybe about whose sandals were cuter. Who knows? But my conflict this week could be easily described as being not of the same mind as someone I care for. But the guilt that wrecked me afterwards was not about our disagreement, but about my ability to heed Paul's advice. I did not stand firm where it counted. Now I'm going to back up and I'm going to give some background. Many of you know that I got here from seminary and I had a few jobs before that in marketing, but you don't really know how I got here as in up in the pulpit today, called to ordain ministry. The way that I tell it is usually something along these lines. I grew up the daughter of a minister. But when I went off to college, my mom pushed me to find my own identity. Growing up the daughter of a minister means that you will always be that preacher's kid. <laughs> Instead of joining the Methodist group on campus, 
I joined a service sorority and then a Bible study. This Bible study, it turns out, was perhaps the worst thing that would ever happen to my faith. You see, two things happened. One, as someone who comes from a denomination that does not often use the word saved, since our views of salvation are more of a process than an event, as some other denominations believe, I was confused when someone asked me if I was. Saved, that is. Saved? What's saved? What does that mean? I mean, I guess not. As everyone's eyes were closed and heads were bent, the Bible study leader asked for anyone who was not saved to raise their hand. It's okay. Everyone's eyes are closed. Confused, I slowly raised mine. I guess I'm not. He had everyone open their eyes and look around to see whose hands were raised. And then I was escorted to the back room so that the leaders of the Bible study could pray over me. It was there that I learned not to trust Christians. Second, I used the Bible study as a means to confess. I had done some things that I wasn't really proud of. But I learned quickly that those also were not kept confidential. When the mother of someone in the Bible study called me so that she could let me know how awful she thought I was. Your father is a preacher. You should be ashamed. And your parents should be even more. How could they have raised you? It was, once again, a time where I learned not to trust Christians. So I moved on. I found a new community. I decided to rush a Panhellenic sorority. You know, those ones where girls wear pearls and jump up and down and chant and yell at each other. I joined Delta Gamma where I was able to find friends who loved and supported me. I fit in well there. I had great friends who are still my best friends today. In fact, a lot of us went into ministry, which is so ironic. But as a young woman, I was caught up in the Greek lifestyle. And despite all efforts by DG to keep me reined in, and yes, they made lots of efforts to keep me reined in, I was constantly testing boundaries, and there are now some things that I'm rather ashamed of. Fast forward a few years, and I finally found my way back to church. I found myself in a loving community in Charlotte full of persons who did not judge me. They did not spill my secrets. They did not shame me for my past. Instead, they loved me where I was at and pushed me forward to a future filled with hope. My story, I believe, is one of the biggest testimonies for the Wesleyan view of grace. See, God was with me the entire way, protecting me, whispering in my ear, loving me. And even as I pushed him away, his grace continued, reaching out to me. Once I was ready to accept that grace at 23, my life would be forever changed. No. Nobody wants to be a pastor. I'm just going to let you in on the little secret. When you're two and you're dreaming of driving around a Lamborghini, it's not pastor on your mind that you think is going to get you there. But through the Holy Spirit working through that community of believers when I was 23, I made the decision to follow Christ. Now, don't get me wrong. I had to make a lot of sacrifices. I left a great paying job because I was constantly surrounded by sinful behavior that I knew would pull me back into temptation. I struggled for several years going back to USC. In fact, this was the first time that I went back in about seven years because I could still feel the shame of who I'd been and who I'd hurt. But as the healing continued and my relationship with Christ deepened, I also decided that my past would no longer be the thing that I regretted, but the thing that inspired me to walk with others towards Christ. This past week, though, someone questioned my character. They asked the question, how in the world could I change so much so quickly? It was a fair enough question. In this world where we're taught not to trust persons who have failed once, it would make sense that we would want to protect ourselves. I mean, a cheater is always a cheater. A thief is always a thief. Don't give second chances because they might just bite you in the butt. But as this person was asking me these things, in the back of my head, I was thinking, isn't it obvious? I didn't change me. Christ did. My decision to follow his ways made me aware of my own sinfulness in a way that I couldn't see before. These words remained in the back of my mind, though. Instead of these words, the words that came spilling out of my mouth were not the testimony of the things that God has done for me, but the things that I have done. 
I left my job. I removed people from my life. I changed. I. 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 The focus should have been on God, but instead it was on me. See, God didn't come just to transform me. He came to transform the entire world. But when we think selfishly, we aren't standing firm in the Lord. We aren't saying to others, God died for you too. We are saying to others, I'm going to keep this secret to myself because I'm not sure how you might handle it. Paul says, stand firm in the Lord. Because we're all tempted. Times will get tough. Paul knows this because he sees people in conflict because they're not a united front. Conflict can be a good thing. In one of the commentaries I read, it likened conflict to being like two stones rubbing against each other. Sometimes they bring out their sharp edges to make room for themselves. But other times, those stones rubbing against each other can shape and mold the other. You see, conflict changes us. And it can change us for the better, or it can change us for the worse. We have the power to decide. Paul tells us how to handle this as well. He goes on and says, rejoice in the Lord always. This isn't just a rejoicing in the times of happiness. Anyone can do that. I can rejoice when the game talks in, for example. And I do. <laughs> or I can rejoice that I had the ability to go and see the game parts play. We can rejoice in the conflict that makes us stronger. We can rejoice in the way that conflict is constantly chiseling us and refining us. Or we can only rejoice when things are good. When things are like we like them. But you see, God is working in all of that. He's working in the mess and the muck. He's working in the tears. He's working in the pain. And he's working in the argument. The conflict. God is at work here today, even when you aren't happy. There's a video circulating of Victoria Osteen, the wife of Joel Osteen, speaking some major heresies to the church. And I just want to back up and say... I will very rarely speak about another pastor. I have the belief that we all have different ideas as to what is right and what is wrong, and as long as we are all preaching the gospel, I don't like to split hairs. Gets me in trouble sometimes, but I don't. Our job as pastors are lead the world to a closer relationship with Christ, and none of us are perfect at it, and none of us are 100% right all the time, because, well, nobody knows God perfectly other than Jesus Christ, his son. But when someone of this kind of power speaks heresies, I worry that someone in one of my congregations might be listening to it. And so I do want to bring up what the Osteen said. Here's a direct quote, at least the best that I could dictate it from the video. Victoria says this, I just want to encourage every one of us to realize when we obey God, we are not doing it for God. We're doing it for ourselves. Because God takes pleasure when we're happy. That's what gives him the greatest joy. So I want you to know this morning, just do good for your own self. Do good because God wants you to be happy. When you come to church, when you worship him, you're not doing it for God. You're doing it for yourself because that's what makes God happy. Y'all, this simply is not true. Salvation isn't selfish. It isn't about us. It's about a God who loved the world so much that he gave his son to save it in its entirety. He didn't just save me. He didn't just save the people in this room. He saved the world. And y'all, here's the thing. There are some people out there who are carrying around such guilt from their past. Such pain. Such brokenness. They feel unloved. And sometimes they feel unloved because they're unhappy. And they're being told God makes you happy. Sure, God rejoices when we rejoice. But that happiness does not stem from our own desires. That rejoicing stems from being so conformed to God's image that our desires are his desires. But God is also heartbroken over our heartache. He can see the future, sure. He knows that our conflicts can lead us to being conformed to his image. But he still weeps when we weep. His heart still breaks over our pain. Our sin. It's been a rough week this week for many people. 
We went through the prayer concerns earlier. There's some here, some elsewhere. And all they need is a little bit of the Lord for each one of us in this room reaching out to them. But sometimes that just doesn't make us happy enough. See, Paul doesn't say, stand firm in what you want to do. Nope. He says, stand firm in the Lord. And Paul doesn't say, be in the same mind by holding a committee meeting to agree on whatever you want to do, and God will just go along with it. Nope. Sorry, Methodist. He says to be of the same mind in the Lord. And God doesn't say, be happy in whatever makes you happy, and that will make God happy too. Nope. He says, rejoice in the Lord. Always. Always. So how do you know when to stand firm and when to stand down? How do you know when you're standing firm in the Lord and not in your own desires? Well, Paul goes on to tell us to stop worrying. Don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. There's this great quote that I love. Have you prayed as much as you've asked your friends for advice? God is almighty. God is sustainer. God is the constant. God is the ultimate rock who forms us. And yet sometimes we forget to go to him in prayer. Sometimes we may not like where he leads. Other times we just claim to be too busy. And sometimes we just plain don't want to. God is there waiting for us to go to him for help. And only God knows when to stand firm and when to back down. Paul, as a church, we constantly fail to stand firm in the Lord. We don't look for ways to bring new people to Christ. We look for ways to bring new people into the church because we want to have more people than the church down the street. And we don't stand firm when someone asks about our faith because that might be kind of weird. And that person might not like us anymore. We are so afraid of what people might think of us that we aren't willing to stand firm. And we don't reach out to those who are hurting because it might take us to some painful places. It may not make us happy. And we are so afraid of conflict that we aren't willing to stand firm even in the ways that the Lord leads us. But standing firm in the Lord is what gives way to the Holy Spirit. At one of the churches I worked for in Atlanta, when you were baptized, you did a video testimony. Now, we obviously don't do this here, partially because we Methodists do confirmation instead of believer's baptism. But the pastor there once said this, those baptism videos are more powerful than any of his sermons. And we're talking a very famous, very good pastor and preacher. You see, I could tell everyone in Brown Summit my story, and in fact, I do hope that I have that chance. But some of them are just going to say, sure, you have to say that. You're the preacher. But your story, all of your stories, they are powerful. They are meaningful. They will change lives. So as we go out into the world this week, let's look for opportunities to tell our stories. Let's look for opportunities to love in the way that the Lord requires. And let's pray for the confidence of the Lord to stand firm as we are tempted and trialed in ways that make us want back down. Christ has done everything for us. Christ has done everything for the world. Now let's go let them know about it. Amen.